I'm Jerry Schubel, president of the aquarium. It's good to see those of you who were brave enough to come out in the rain. And I also want to welcome all of you who are watching online, home and dry in your living rooms. I want to acknowledge our sponsors, Gazette Newspapers and the Marriott Courtyard downtown. Tonight, we're going to hear from a very important guy, Dr. Curtis Marion, and he's going to discuss how human evolution may have been impacted by our living along coasts. Dr. Marion is a professor at Arizona State University's Institute of Human Origins and School of Human Evolution and Social Change. He is also the principal investigator for the South Africa Coast Paleoclimate, Paleoenvironment, Paleoecology, Paleoanthropology project that's based near Mazel Bay at Pinnacle Point, South Africa. He grew up in the Poconos. Those of you who aren't from the East Coast probably don't have any idea where the Poconos are. Those are mountains in Pennsylvania. He got his bachelor's degree from Penn State, his PhD from the University of California, Berkeley. He has conducted research in Kenya, Tanzania, Somalia, and South Africa. Previously, he served on the faculty and as director of the Interdepartmental Program in Anthropological Sciences at Stony Brook University in New York. He wrote a very important article for general audiences in Scientific America on how the sea saved humanity. And he wrote another article in Scientific American on how we humans conquered the planet. He's referred to us as the world's most invasive species of all. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Curtis Marion. Thanks very much for that kind introduction. Um, I had the pleasure of going through the aquarium today and a uh, beautiful spot to come and visit. It was always a tradition in my family that every city that we went to and we drug our kids around to a lot of different cities, we'd always go to the aquariums. But unfortunately, they're too old and now they're 20 and 16 and they would never travel with their dad again. So <laughs> unfortunately, I wasn't able to bring them here, but I'm going to figure out a way to, to do it sometime soon. Um, so uh, thank you for that, that kind introduction. I'm, I'm going to talk about um, how coastal life uh, likely had an impact on uh, human origins. And um, that, of course, intersects with the interests of conservation interests and the intellectual interests of, of, of the aquarium. Um, and uh, it, like, like Jerry said at the beginning, I've written a couple of general public articles that are uh, versions of scientific papers that I, I've written to try to you know, get the ideas out to the public and, and get them fired up and, and so on. And, and uh, so I, I appreciate the fact that I got invited here. That's, those articles are probably why I got invited. So thank you for inviting me to the, to the aquarium. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off with a slide that I've been using for 10 years. But because human origins research changes so rapidly, I end up changing this slide, adding little bits and pieces to it almost uh, every month. Um, but I'm, it, it's a simplified slide of the last 800,000 years of human evolution. And I just want to point out a, a couple of things for you. Uh, hopefully I get this right. Is that the, the pointer is? It's the top of the, the circle. Top of the circle. There we go. OK. This line that you see here is a high resolution record of global climate change from the Epica ice core, which is an ice core in Antarctica. So when that line is up here, we're in a warm phase, so an interglacial. And when that line is down here in the, the blue, we're in a, a cold phase. And the scale here is thousands of years, so that's 800,000 years ago. And kind of the take home message that you can get from that graph is that for the majority of the last 800,000 years of human evolution, and we can think think of that as the latter part of human evolution. That's what created, that's the time that created us. The world is in a glacial phase, right? Most of that line is down there. It's only once in a while it pops up into this warm phase. And of course, we're in a warm phase here. And in fact, uh, if we had measurements, it would be way up here, uh, no doubt. Um, so keep that in mind. 
And then secondly, what I've created up here is a kind of a simplified version of the main lineages that lead to modern humans. And what we know is, is around 800,000 years, um, 800,000 years ago, there was what I've called an African archaic lineage, and there was a Eurasian archaic lineage. And they, they derive from a single hominin that at, at one point um, left Africa. And uh, when these lines end in a circle, that means they, they end in extinction, okay? So around 800,000 years ago, they share a common ancestor. And that common ancestry is maintained up until about 400,000 years ago by gene flow between these two populations. And that gene flow occurs because people are moving in and out of Africa, okay? But interestingly, around 400,000 years ago, that gene flow gets cut. And when you have populations get genetically isolated, they start to diverge. So around 400,000 years ago, the African lineage and the Eurasian lineage begin to separate um, from each other. And there's a couple of reasons why that gene flow may have been cut, but I, I don't want to get into the details of that now. And then around 300,000 years ago, this one lineage uh, in Eastern Asia that we now call the Denisovan lineage um, appeared. And the Neanderthal lineage, which pretty much everybody has heard about before, that one also appears shortly after that. So in other words, they're recognizable as a population of, of hominins. And then sometime around 200,000 to 150,000 years ago, the modern human lineage appears in Africa. And by that I mean that's the lineage that leads to everybody alive on the planet uh, today, okay? And notice uh, they, they, have, um, they have an arrow, which means that they're still with us. That's us. And then around 70,000 years ago, a founder population of that African lineage leaves Africa, goes out probably through the Middle East, and they give rise to all Eurasians. So at that point in human evolution, we have two main lineages, an African lineage and a Eurasian lineage. And that founder population that leaves Africa um, encounters Neanderthals and they interbreed with them. So that all people of Eurasian ancestry have some Neanderthal DNA in them. But Africans don't, okay, so that's quite a significant dis distinction from an evolutionary standpoint. And then, um, as these populations, these, this founder population moves east, it gives rise to many, many other lineages in Eurasia. And that's kind of a, a human pattern, is that wherever our population goes, it separates into many lineages, and those basically are ethno-linguistic groups, right? So those are people who speak different languages. And the Melanesian and Aboriginal lineage encounter Denisovans and interbreed with them, such that people from Papua New Guinea, indigenous people from Papua New Guinea and Australia have chunks of Denisovan DNA in their, their genome. And then even more interesting is After that founder population leaves Africa, the modern African lineage interbred with archaic African lineages that then go extinct, such that Africans have snippets of ancient archaic DNA in them. So the take home message from that story is there's only one lineage of humans left, the modern human lineage, but we have little pieces of these ancient lineages in our genome as clues to who those people were in the past. And they are under intensive study. Now something to remember, a curious fact about humans and human origins is despite all the diversity, the physical diversity that you see in all these hundreds of lineages, right? And I've only put a couple of arrows there. 
we're characterized by very, very narrow genetic diversity. And that's a point that's made in that very nice five-minute video clip that you show here at, in, at the aquarium. When I saw it today. We look very different, act different, speak different languages, but our genetic diversity is tiny. And that requires explanation, how that actually happened. So let's zoom in on that last couple hundred thousand years. So here we are at only 450,000 years. Here's that same curve I showed you. And I noted before that um, the modern human lineage appears during the last 200,000 years ago to about 150, 130,000 years ago. And that's a very intense, cold glacial phase that we call marine isotope stage six. And that lineage, which appeared in Africa, gave rise to everybody alive on the planet today. Now, the reason that's really significant is that generally, Africa responds to glacial periods by being very arid. So for example, here's a vegetation reconstruction of what Africa might have looked like during a glacial phase. And you can see the Sahara is twice the size as it is today. Central Africa is an isolated little area. The Namib and Botswana deserts are much, much bigger. It's desert all the way down into the Horn of Africa. And what I've argued is, is that at that time, there was probably um, four to six areas in Africa that are potential refuge zones to support hunter-gatherer populations. And one of those zones would have been where the progenitor lineage comes from. Now, I've argued it was that one on the southern coast of Africa, which is why I've been doing field work there uh, since the mid-1990s. But I have colleagues who would challenge that, and they would say, no, it's North Africa, or no, it's Central Africa, and they have field projects there. But I think the hypothesis I've put forward is probably the strongest hypothesis. And I'm going to explain to you tonight why I think that. Okay, so I talked about that in this first article that I wrote in Scientific American, and here it, it is. It was my first attempt at public science writing, but I had published it in a science, scientific paper um, in the Journal of Human Evolution. And what I argued was the coastline provides a uniquely rich and stable source of food. And importantly, those foods during um, harsh glacial phases the richness and stability would be the same. So in other words, terrestrial environments would be depleted in their resource base by glacial phases, while the coastline and this area in particular would retain the food richness. And that's why they're good refuge zones. There has to be an ecological argument to it, and that's it. So here's something that a lot of people don't know. We have six recognized floral kingdoms in the world. Look how big most of them are, the Neotropical Kingdom and the whole Arctic one, Paleotropical. And look at the tiniest one on that map. It's the Cape of South Africa. And that Cape has one of the highest species diversity of plants of anywhere in the world, 10,000 species of plants in that little tiny sliver of space. Um, and 60% of those plants are endemic, so they're only found there. And that's why it's been recognized you know, for so long as its own distinct um, floral kingdom. But the reason this is important for human evolution is because this particular floral kingdom has a very high diversity of geophytic plants. And geophytic plants are plants with underground storage organs, things like bulbs and tubers and so on. And they're a, they're a preferred food for hunter-gatherers because they have a big chunk of carbohydrate that's below ground, that if you have a digging stick, you can dig it up and get it very easy. But of course, lots of animals, animals don't, other animals don't have digging sticks. It's a great niche that humans can get into. But just take a quick look at this graph. On the x-axis, I have area, right, and uh, kilometers. And on this axis, I have the species diversity. So that's the number of plants. And these are Mediterranean ecosystems. So 
ecosystems that have winter rainfall, as we're finding out today, you're, you're one of these winter rainfall zones. California coastal vegetation is a Mediterranean macchia ecosystem. Mediterranean macchia ecosystems tend to have lots of geophytes, but plant diversity is normally a function of area. The bigger the area, the more species of plants. It's a law in ecology. But look, look at the Cape. It demolishes that relationship. There are 2,400 species of plants in the Cape, and it's the smallest in area, right? California has what, maybe, I don't know what that's probably 200 species next to 2,400. So, and those below ground tuberous plants, um, they retain their nutritiousness in harsh climates because the plant bulb is protected, okay? So I argued that that's a terrestrial food that would have helped humans through these harsh glacial phases. And it's due to the special ecological conditions of South Africa. One of the other things that makes the South African environment super rich is this collision of different ocean currents. You have the warm tropical Agullus current coming down the east coast, and you have this Benguela cold upwelling here on the west coast, and they collide in this zone, and that mixing of warm and cold water creates one of the richest intertidal zones anywhere in the world. So that ecosystem, that oceanic condition produces very rich intertidal shellfish available for collection if you know how to collect them, if you can do it effectively. And that's, that's the challenge which I'm going to talk about. But here's something else we know about this area. There's a very gradual offshore platform. And, and this is the current coastline in South Africa. And this is our 3D model of the offshore platform at maximum glacial drop. So 18,000 years ago, sea levels were 120 meters below where they are today. And when that occurred, the coastline was way out here. And we now know from 15 years of research uh, that this was a very, very special ecosystem. In South Africa, you have winter rainfall on the west coast. And in east coast, you have summer rainfall. And this sets up the perfect conditions for a migration ecosystem. So when this was exposed, we think that animals were wintering um, in the west when it rained there. And then in the summer, they moved back to the east to take advantage of the green grass that's in the summer rains. And the people that lived in these caves, we have these little target zones here. This is daily foraging radius. were able to intercept those animals and hunt them. So in those coastal caves, we find the bones of those big migratory animals like wildebeest and zebra, which do not live in that area today, but they lived on that, that exposed continental shelf. So what you have is this extraordinary triumvirate of foods. You have intertidal shellfish, you have below ground tuberous plants, and you have migratory fauna. And there's no environment anywhere in the world that had those three together like that. So that's why during these glacial phases, this area is a very, very special place for people to be. So what happened after um, we see the origin of that population, the modern human population during this glacial? We have this big interglacial right there. We call that marine isotope stage five, okay? Now during marine isotope stage five, Africa would have looked a lot like this. Notice the Sahara now is gone. It's actually a, a grassland ecosystem, which is why we find hippo bones and crocodile bones out in the Sahara. And at that time, what probably happened was the progenitor population, and if it was in South Africa like I think it was, would have expanded out into the rest of Africa, right? Radiating into different ethno-linguistic groups. And then at 70,000 years ago, one of those groups leaves Africa and initiates the great human diaspora, which was the subject of that second Scientific American paper I wrote in, in 2015. So out of Africa they go, and I've put there 80 to 60, but 70 really seems to be 
the sweet spot number um, from the latest evidence that we have. And by 65,000 years ago, they make it to Australia. And this is really extraordinary to think about because uh, in geological time, that's, that's the blink of an eye. And those people who are tropical Africans, right, they leave Africa, they make it all the way to the shores of Southeast Asia. You can't see Australia. But they were able to imagine a land that they couldn't see, one that they could go to and conquer, and they built boats, put their families on those boats, sailed them out into the ocean, made it to Australia, and went into the most harshest environments in Australia almost instantaneously. And when they did that, there was a massive extinction of the local fauna. We know that by 45 to 40,000 years ago, they make it into Western Eurasia, somewhat of a lag, and we don't know why that is, and Neanderthals go extinct. By 45,000 years ago, they've made it into the Arctic, where they're blocked for a while, and then they make it into North America by 14,000 years ago. And there's another massive megafaunal extinction that, that goes along with that event. So when does that happen? That happens, is initiated during a glacial phase, marine isotope stage four, that starts around 74,000 years ago. So people are leaving Africa at that point, maybe pushed out by, by climate change. Okay, so now I want you to use your imagination for just a minute. Imagine, like, I don't know, maybe if you watch Star Trek, I'm a big lover of Star Trek, but imagine you're a spacefaring species, not modern humans. And you come, you know, you're traveling around looking at the evolution of other planets and you come you come to Earth, let's say, 200,000 years ago, and you look down, oh, when people are running around, they're highly mobile hunter-gatherers, they have fire and stone tools, a little bit of symbolic culture, but they're not very interesting, so off you go. You come back around 100,000 years ago, and they're still basically doing the same thing, Stone Age culture. They've radiated into a couple of different interesting variants, kind of boring, off you go. You come back around uh, 70,000 years ago, 60,000 years ago, and oh, the, the African one, it's leaving Africa. Okay, well, let's come back and see what happens. You come back to today, right? And the African one has spread all over the planet. All the other species are extinct. And that one is now coming out into space. I'd, that would scare the crap out of me if I was. In fact, I'd turn my lasers up to 11 and I'd smoke that planet. So that's an incredible event, really, right? We're still in the great human diaspora. It's a blink of geological time that these events are, are happening. So. Now I'm going to ask the question, how and why did this happen, right? Modern humans have a unique combination of three traits that I'm going to talk about. Advanced cognition. We're really smart. And that smartness, part of that smartness is symbolic behavior, the ability to think of analogies and use them to create things like language, right? Complex thought. We have this really special unique psychology for social learning. It's, I mean, there's a lot of social learning in the animal world, but ours is quite different. Human children are born expecting to be taught. And if they're not taught, really bad things happen. And we're extremely cooperative. We cooperate with unrelated individuals at a level that's just way, way above any other animal. And when you add those three things together, you get the capacity for modern human cumulative culture, this ratcheting up of complexity of technology and, and so on. And these three capacities, in my opinion, and I, th I think most 
social scientists would agree on me with me on this. So these three things, advanced cognition, psychology for social learning, and extreme cooperation are evolved. So they're embedded in the genome. You re you're evolved to behave that way. So if that's the case, then we have to have evolutionary explanations for them. That's why we study them as paleoanthropologists. So I've argued that the trait that evolved late and explains the, the great human diaspora is cooperation. I think cooperation evolved late. Neanderthals didn't have it. Denisovans didn't have it. And that's why modern humans were able to replace them. So I've told that story in that paper that Jerry talked about, how we conquered the planet, calling us the most invasive species. I've heard so much from people about that. As you can, <laughs> what about ants? <laughs> no, we're more invasive than ants. Uh, and I've written a couple of scientific papers about that. Um, and I think we, we conquered the planet because of that. And I think the coastal adaptation is a, is a good, um, it, it's a good system, e economic system, that created an evolutionary structure for the evolution of cooperation. And, I'll, and I'm going to talk about why that is. So what's the evidence for these things that I've been talking about? Now I'm going to take you to South Africa. And South Africa just has an abundance of really important coastal sites that have told us so much about modern human origins. In fact, I don't think there's any other record anywhere in the world that comes close to matching the richness of the South African record. It's truly unique, which is why I'm there doing uh, the research I'm doing. So here's those sites that I just had on that map, and time range is on this axis. So my research team has been working in Mosel Bay. So these sites are Pinnacle Point sites, which is the specific locality that we work at. PP13B, PP56. FLIR SPY is a, 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 a dune system that has open air sites. And um, you can see we've been able to develop the longest record of any of these sites. And I'm going to focus on the ones I've worked on, but I'm going to also point out where the other sites are important. So here's an aerial view of uh, Pinnacle Point, and I'm going to talk mostly about PP13B and PP56. And we excavated PP13B between 2000 and 2007, and PP56 between 2006, and we finished a year ago. It took 12 years to complete the excavations at PP56. I thought it was a three-year job. It, the sequence turned into 16 vertical meters of human occupation. It's just incredible. So there's a look outside of PP13B and a look from the inside out. It's kind of like a ship's portal. Uh, there's our excavation team, uh, aerial photograph of the people working. We have very, very advanced field technique. A lot of the field technique we use, we've developed. It's all digital. Everything is measured with total stations, which basically fire out a laser beam, allow us to measure everything in three dimensions at millimetric accuracy. It all goes to handheld computers and, and then onto computers on site. So uh, we have a lot of excavation control over what we're doing. Uh, PP56 is um, under that, is a rock shelter. You can see it under there. And that's the deposit right there. And again, if you can use your imagination, when this site was inhabited, the coastline was a few kilometers away. And this was the land surface, OK? So at one time, uh, during, you know, today, at one time, the land surface would have gone out like this. But that's all been eaten away by the Holocene high sea level, which comes right up to the base of, of the cave. So uh, the, the sediments are all truncated. And we're digging on the back slope of, of that. Um, truncated set of deposits. There's my uh, good, a good part of my team working. Um, we, I have a permanent team in South Africa of 10 people. They're all local South Africans. Uh, most of them um, have no training, background training in archaeology. In fact, most of them don't have high school degrees. But we've trained them in field archaeology and lab archaeology and 
That's now, this is now their careers. Uh, and that field team supports a number of different projects. We, we have a project consortium that we have. So it operates all year, all year round. So PP13B dates from 160, 160,000 years ago to 90. And then PP3, PP56 picks up at 90 and goes to 50. So together, they, they date from 160,000 years ago to 50,000 years ago. The first big discovery that we had from Pinnacle Point was published in Nature in 2007. And that paper reported on the earliest evidence that we have for systematic coastal resource use. And it's still the, the earliest evidence that we have for that. And that's dated to 160,000 years ago. And they're eating primarily brown mussels. Uh, and of course, you have mussels here in, in California. And uh, Ali Kroikel, that's a, local, that's a local name for turbo. This is a sea snail. You know, it's about this, you know, a big one is about this big, a little bit bigger than your fist. But we find, we even found whale barnacles. And these are barnacles that live only on the skin of whales. They're not hunting whales. We know that. They don't have boat technology. But what it indicates to us is that they're scavenging whales. And they're bringing into the cave the blubber and the skin and, and meat. So it's a proxy for the fact that not only are they collecting shellfish, but they're, they're monitoring the coast for wash-ups. And we also have seal bone in the site. And again, we, we know that that's scavenged. It's not, it's not hunted. And then also at Pinnacle Point around 110,000 years ago, we have evidence that they're, they're starting to collect seashells. And um, we know that these are seashells because they're not processed for food, and they have beach wear on them. And what that beach wear means is, is that the animal was dead in the surf and was agitated back and forth on the sand, and it picked up that, that wear. And even today, these two animals are prized by local seashell collectors. And we tend to find them close to ochre, right, pigment. So there's some kind of symbolic activity. And collecting of things and gifting seashells is a, is a symbolic, symbolic act. At, the other, at a site called Blumboss, which is down the coast from us, we've actually found, um, in South Africa, we call these perlamoon. Um, here in California, you, you call them uh, um, abalone, you're right. <laughs> so we call them perlamoon in, in South Africa. Here you call them abalone. They're roughly the same size. And what they were doing is they were mixing pigments in those abalone. That's the earliest evidence we have for people mixing pigment. Now, we don't know what those pigments were used for, but they were used either for painting, right, rock art, or painting your body. And both of those acts, is a, it's a symbolic um, act. At several sites, we have now found shell beads. And the shell beads date back to 80 to 70,000 years ago. Some, of, some sites in North Africa have it, but we also have them in South Africa. And of course, ornamentation is a, is a symbolic act. Now, here's what I think is some of the best evidence we have for a complex cog cognition. Now, I, most of you, given the fact that you live near the coast, probably know this already. But when I give talks to audiences who are not familiar with the coast, you, you actually have to explain it. So as you know, um, in the intertidal zone, you have a stratification to different zones that have different shellfish types in them. And um, we have two different types of tide systems. You have neap tides and spring tides, right? And spring tide, the spring doesn't mean season. What it means is the tide springs back and forth from really high to really low, OK? Now, under a neap tide situation, right, um, you have access at low tide to the top two zones for shellfish collection. And they're reasonably productive, but they're not super productive. But watch the moon. When the moon and the sun come into alignment, the gravitational forces are additive. And that's when we have what we call a spring tide. 
And during a spring tide, because of the strength of the gravitational force, low tide is really low and high tide is really high. But those really, really low tides give you access to the lower two collection zones, right? So if, if you're a, a coastal forager, to make it productive, you need to know when to go into that lower zone. And the only way you know that is by understanding the relationship between lunar cycles and tidal return rates. And you have to be able to teach people that. And we know this from the ethnography. If you're a surfer or you're a fisherman and you go to a new region in the world, what's the first thing you buy? The tide chart, right? And it's as complex as the Mayan calendar because it's on a lunar schedule, not a solar schedule. So it's constantly changing. But coastal people know this relationship. And they teach it downstream to their children and to other people. So in my opinion, the reason coastal foraging happens so late in human evolution, right, happens around 160,000. Why not a million years ago? I think it's because figuring this out is hard. And then building a calendar system, which is a symbolic activity, is even harder. So we had to have a, culture, a, a cognitively advanced hominid before we could have a coastal adaptation. You see what I'm saying? OK, so when do we see that? Here's our, our zones, right? This is very dangerous to be in. This, you need a lot of caution. And the top one you can get to. Uh, these are all, this is time here. And these are the sites that have shellfish from these different zones. And what you find is they start in the easy one, 160,000 years ago. And by 110, 120, they've gotten into the caution zone one. And a little bit later, into the dangerous one. And by this time, they've definitely figured out the lunar tidal system. If not, they'd be killed while they're foraging. So in my opinion, this is, this is when we have um, a tr really good evidence for a true coastal adaptation. And in my opinion, that has downstream impacts that are important, which I'm going to talk about um, in a minute. What else did we find? We found at the same time we see the coastal adaptation, we see evidence for pigments. So they're painting, symbolic activity. That dates to 160,000 years ago. By 70,000 years ago, they're decorating the pigments. In fact, what we think these are are stamps. They're putting symbols on the pigment. What, and the way you use it is you rub the pigment to create a little bit of powder, you put a little bit of fat on it, and then you can stamp your body or you can stamp the wall with it. These are the, the earliest real symbols that we have anywhere in the world today in, in the coast of South Africa. In 2009, we published a paper in Science where we showed that they had begun, they had invented pyrotechnology. And this particular type of pyrotechnology is called heat treatment. It's where you take a, a stone that in its natural state is not particularly good for uh, making stone artifacts. You heat it under controlled conditions, and it produces a stone that looks like that. So that stone was experimentally made from a heat-treated piece of, of that. And this is very complex. So to do it, you have to procure stone. You have to procure wood. You have to build yourself a simple kiln. Then you, you bring it up to a, a particular temperature. If you don't get the temperature right, it explodes. Then you can make artifacts that look like that. These really highly advanced blade and uh, biface technologies that we see first in South Africa. So that's another indicator of a complex cognition. People are showing novel association, so they can make the connection between heat transforming a raw material. That's the basis of industry. And then they can make a complex chain technology and pass it on to children and other people. So I think that evidence shows us that by marine isotope stage six, when we have the origin population, we have evidence for a complex advanced cognition. So what about extreme cooperation? That's what I'm going to end my talk on. 
What do I mean by extreme cooperation? I've called it hyper-prosociality. It means cooperation with non-kin. Lots of animals cooperate with kin, but not non-kin. Humans do it, and it facilitates group formation, extended social networks, ultimately allows us to build ethnolinguistic groups. We, we also do this thing called cooperative breeding, what we also called alloparenting, where multiple individuals assist with the upbringing of children. And it also ends up in formal mate exchange. In anthropology, we call that reciprocal exogamy. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a second. And all of that is made possible by an innate proclivity to follow rules and enforce third-party punishment. That allows us to live in these really complex social groups that we live in. This is all unique to modern humans, right? There's no other animal that has anything like this. It also leads to what uh, Michael Tomasello has called collective intentionality. It's this kind of group mindedness that humans have, this usness feeling. Boy, we're seeing a lot of it now, right? We saw a lot of it during the recession. Um, it also results in skills and motivations and emotional intelligence to operate within a society as a whole. And again, very unique to humans. But it has a downstream negative impact. Uh, what um, Ernst Fair has called parochial altruism or outgroup bias. You tend, humans tend to favor people who look or talk, have culture similar to them. And they have bias against people who, who look different. And these two emotional responses seem to be related to each other. Okay? So that has positive and negative implications. The high level of cooperation allows us to do like seemingly really stupid things like this. All get onto planes with seats that are way too small and fed crap food and fly for 17 hours without killing each other, right? Sometimes there's an outbreak of violence. But, and, but this cooperation is what allows us to build civilization, right? But here's what it also allows us to do, be very warlike. So cooperation has these two um, a kind of opposing things. Now, what about other animals? Chimps our closest living relatives. They have a single level of society, no hyperprosociality. Chimps live in groups, 20, 25 individuals or more. And at the boundaries of those groups, there's constant conflict. There's no cooperation between groups of chimps. Humans, on the other hand, we also live in groups. We call those bands. So hunter-gatherers live in band sizes of 20, 25 individuals, and 30 maybe. And those bands have outgroup marriage. So there are contracts between individuals in the bands, and individuals move between those bands for marriage. That binds the groups together so that you have kin, and people you trust in the other band. And when put together, that creates an ethnolinguistic group. And as Bernard Chappé showed in a recent book, it is the foundational kin structure of all modern humans. Every modern human group in the world has outgroup marriage. And that's what binds these groups together into ethnolinguistic groups. So we have a structure that looks like that as opposed to the chimps, where each local group is against all the others. And of course, at the boundaries of those groups, we have conflict. So what I argued in my papers was is that a very late occurring evolutionary behavior was high level of cooperation. So most of human evolution, we had the primitive system, the chimp level society. At some point, multi-level society evolved. And out of that cooperation with unrelated individuals and the formation of ethnolinguistic group structure. And when you put those two organisms into competition with each other, 
the group with multi-level society will win every time because you can field large numbers of warriors, 80, 100, as opposed to five or 10 from a band level society. So how do we evolve cooperation? There's a great book and a series of papers, mostly by Sam Bowles, that have argued that the only way you get the evolution of cooperation is through conflict. He's built uh, computer models and so on that, um, to show this. So what he's argued is you get between comp group competition leads to intergroup conflict, the end result being that groups with highly cooperative individuals expand at the expense of those without individuals. And you see this all the time. The, the better a group cooperates, the more successful they will be. And that resulted in the spread of cooperation and kind of the genetics for it in modern humans. The problem is, how do we develop between group co competition? Because in Africa, terrestrial hunter-gatherers are the harmless people. It's a famous ethnographic book on the Bushman people in southern Africa. Uh, where Elizabeth Marshall Thomas pointed out that these are some of the most peaceful people in the world. In general, hunter-gatherers in Africa living off of terrestrial resources have very low levels of warfare. So if warfare caused the evolution of cooperation, how do we turn a very um, peaceful context into one that looked like that? Well, we have a very simple model for explaining this. We have, this is kind of a graphical representation of it. We have resource predictability on this axis and resource density on this one. So higher resource predictability, higher resource density. And what we know is, is that when resources are predictable and dense, we have high levels of territorial behavior. So in other words, defense, active defense of those resources. And what are the modern ones? Great agricultural land. People have fought over those for thousands of years. And important resources like oil, water will be the one in the future that people will be fighting over. If it's dense and predictable, it pays to fight to protect it, and it pays to try to take it. So when, in Africa, do we have dense and predictable resources, and when do people exploit them? And I've written about that in this publication. That's what I'm going to end the talk with. So in that graph, African terrestrial resources are here. They don't stimulate territoriality and warfare. Riverine resources are the type of resources that stimulate warfare. They're dense, predictable. Ethnographic record shows us everywhere in the world that we have it. Hunter-gatherers fought over it. The problem is you need really complex technology to exploit them. And riverine adaptations don't occur until very late, Holocene in Africa. Coastal resources are another example. Everywhere we have coastal resource use among hunter-gatherers, you have high levels of warfare. And it requires no technology to exploit it. You just have to be smart and have figured out the lunar tidal system to exploit them. To give you an idea, speaking about the local hunter-gatherers here in California, John Johnson um, talking about Chumash, intervillage raids, ritualized battles, large-scale hostility among opposing allied groups and so on was constant in coastal California. But that's, again, very unusual for hunter-gatherers except in coastal contexts. We know that coastal hunter-gatherers are the most warlike anywhere in the world. And look at these injury rates. This is from prehistoric California. So this is the frequency of projectile injuries by age and sex in skeletons found here in coastal California. Males, females. 18, 17% of males have a projectile point in them. That's like saying 18 to 17% of the people you know have been shot by a pistol, right? Really high rates of, of violence. And where are they hitting them? In the thorax, in the head, the neck. Those are kill shots. So this kind of violence, it's, it's common in coastal 
habitats, but it's really uncommon in terrestrial hunter-gatherers. So what I've argued is, is that when people made the shift to coastal resource use, it bumped them into dense and predictable resources, stimulated territoriality and warfare for the first time in human evolution, and that set up the conditions for the evolution of high levels of cooperation. And that, that story is told in the 2015 Scientific American article. And, but to be an effective warrior, you not only have to be cooperative, you have to have great weapons. And in a paper that we published that made the cover of Nature um, in 2012, uh, we documented the earliest evidence for advanced projectile use. Now, these are the stone artifacts that document that use. And you're looking at them, and you're probably thinking, wow, they don't look very impressive. They're small, like a centimeter, little pieces of stone. But here's why they're important. The way you make them is you make a core in a very special way, and you knock off these long, thin blades. And then you take those blades, and you break them in a very particular way. But they're too small to be used in your bare hand. They appear worldwide around 20,000 years ago, but we've documented them in South Africa at 73,000, right before the diaspora, right? This is what you do with them. You take pieces of bone or wood, and you put a groove in them, and you mount them in there. And these are arrows or bolts from an atlatl. They represent the miniaturization of projectile technology to throw it far and hard. Now, the world experts at atlatls were the Australian Aborigines. And here you can see a picture from, I think it's 1914, right, uh, with atlatls. They could hit a bug at 50 meters with one of these things. But what an atlatl does, a spear thrower, it gives you distance, power, and accuracy. And what I think happened was we saw the evolution of cooperation around you know, let's say 100,000 to 150,000, sometime in that sweet spot, when people began exploiting coastal resource use. Around 73,000 years ago, they evolved advanced projectile weapons. And we know that Neanderthals never evolved these, never developed these. And when you put those two things together, you have a new hyper-cooperative species armed with projectiles. And that is a scary organism. It can kill anything on the planet, a whale, if it wants to, with those, those projectiles. It leaves, it creates an animal, it's a super predator. It swarms their prey, and it leaves no competitor or animal safe. Every animal alive on this planet was hunted at one time or another with Stone Age technology, projectile technology of this type. So I think what happened was when modern humans left Africa, they left Africa as a cooperative species armed with advanced projectiles. And that created a planet-wide xenocide where Neanderthals and Denisovans and other human species that lived on the planet were pushed out of their zones and eventually went extinct. And we see successive megafaunal extinctions as humans move into these habitats. Final slide. I'm going to summarize the whole thing for you as, as a, a, high, a theory for the latter part of human origins. 250 to 200,000 years ago, we see the evolution of a complex cognition in the origin of the modern human lineage. That complex cognition allows a shift to dense and predictable resources. Those are tough to harvest. You have to figure it out. You have to be smart to be able to get them. That's the story I told in that paper. But that triggers elevated territoriality and conflict. As soon as they break into that coastal resource niche. And that creates a selection regime for hyper-pro-social, highly cooperative behaviors and collective intentionality. So the, the behaviors to cooperate with people who are in your group but be biased against people outside your group. That results in the formation of multi-scale society, 
bands linked into ethnolinguistic groups. And when we give them advanced projectile weapons, that triggers the great human diaspora at 70,000 years ago and the conquering of the planet and the production of what I've called uh, the most invasive species. Okay, so thanks for your attention. Curtis, thank you. That's a great story, and you're a great storyteller. So is, is, does this also then explain Steven Pinker's uh, recent book about our, the decrease in our conflicts? Yeah, so Steven Pinker wrote a book, many of you I'm sure are familiar with it, where he's uh, both documented um, and explained how, over time, levels of violence have actually gone down. And you know the, the flip side of this is, is we all, the media kind of keeps us all in a state of panic. It's always somebody killing somebody or whatever. But in fact, that, that's just information flow, right? It, it's instantaneous. In fact, levels of violence have gone way, way down. I mean, right now in our hemisphere, there is no country at war with another country. That's unheard of in history. Uh, things are still a little rough on the other side of the pond, but. Um, so uh, there is a decrease in violence. The question would be why, right? And um, I think a lot of the why has to do with the increase in social norms that you know come out of our inherent desire for order. So you, nobody wants violence. You, you, you kind of violence is a is is a tool to get what you want. And uh, if you design systems where people have what they want, for one, and you have rules that keep and check violence as a, as a fallback position to get the things you want, I think you can lower the amount of violence. And I think that's kind of what Steven Pinker's getting at. Who has a question? When we started to develop the cognitive, cognitive ability and we started moving towards cooperation, when did language come in there? That's a great question and we don't really know. It's a, it's a tough one um, because uh, language doesn't have a real good proxy in the record, in the archaeological record for seeing its origin point. So obviously if people are inscribing on cuneiform tablets or something. That's a proxy for language, direct. But we know that you don't have to have written language to have spoken language. So we, we in archaeology, you have to remember, we're always looking for proxies of things we can't see, right? So we're trying to understand when do people develop the capacity for symbolic thought, which is complex. We use ochre and paintings and stuff like that as a proxy. And you could say, oh, that's not a perfect proxy, and you'd be 100% right. Nothing in archaeology is perfect, right? Um, and uh, so trying to find a proxy for language is really, really tough. What I would say we know, okay, and we know this definitively, is that at 74,000 years ago, when people came, or 70,000 years ago, when people came out of Africa, they had language, fully modern language, because all the other languages are, are, are descended from that, uh, an origin point. And we can see that in the language diversity, okay? The other thing I would say is that we definitely, definitely know language, fully modern language was present by 110,000 years ago. So how do I know that? Well, the Khoisan people, the Bushman people that I talked about there, they are the oldest lineage on the planet. Okay, so they're older than any other lineage that we know of. Uh, and they, and they rec recognizably separated from everybody else around 110,000 years ago. So they were an isolated breeding population for quite some time. And they have, they have a fully modern language. So, so the, you follow my logic, right? The shared common ancestor of 
Bushman people and modern people had to have had fully modern language. So that's the number I'm going to give you. It had to have been present 110,000 years ago. But was it present 300,000 or 500,000? We just don't have an answer for you. We have one back here. Yep, wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Um, two, <clears throat> two questions are kind of related. The first one is that the, according to your, ev your evidence and your hypothesis, it was the ability to predict the ever-changing lunar tides that showed you the, the, the planning and the transmission of complex information. Um, my question is, how do you know it wasn't them developing the ability to dive, swim down, and, and, and capture maybe that was the change? Then the second question is, why do you not uh, probe the possibility that they did hunt whales, to your point, rather than have them wash up? Uh, right. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So the answer to the, the first one is, why wouldn't they dive? So those two lower uh, intertidal zones in South Africa, um, if you dove those, you'd be killed immediately. They are, they're shallow, but that's the, that's where the surf is pounding. And there's no way a human could dive those. It's really rough, right? Um, you could dive the infratidal zone because you'd be out beyond the rocky intertidal zone, right? But you could never dive that. The only, and in fact, we, we've published a, I didn't show any of the data because I knew my talk was getting a little bit long. But um, we've, we've just published a paper where we've calculated the real return rates of coastal foraging. And the way we did that was we used local people who uh, know the sea and collect from it today. They're actually descendants of Khoisan people. And um, they went out and they foraged in the intertidal zone. And we, we did time allocation studies. And then we measured all the meat that they got and built up net return rates. It's a classic kind of optimal foraging theory study. And uh, what we were able to show was when they, you, when they foraged the low spring tide, OK, and the low spring tide, it's only an hour and a half. right? I don't know California all that well. But in South Africa, the low spring tide, so the time during the spring tide is, is about five days per lunar month. The low tide during spring is about you know, a couple of hours. That's your window. <coughs> they race down there, forage in that area, and they make a killing, right? They're, all that stuff is coming out. But then they have to get the hell out because the surf rises really quick. And you get caught, it slams you on the rocks. You just, it would just kill you. Um, they're getting 4,000 calories an hour at those prime periods. Now, the highest return rates that have been measured for hunting large terrestrial game with Stone Age technology, 1,400 calories per hour. See what I'm saying? That's, that's the hard number. That's the economics. Somebody was talking to somebody tonight that said they, they only believe in economics. Um, that's, your, that's your return rate on your investment. And um, so what that shows us is, is that if you can figure out that scheduling, you can really do well. Now, here's the thing. When you're in a neap tide, the return rates are universally low. So there's no reason to be on the coast. So the way the optimal strategy is, during you move to the coast during spring tides, you move to the interior during neap tides. How do you know? You watch the lunar phases. And that's what modern hunter-gatherers do who live on the sea. And Greg's second question had to do with what, hunting whales. How, OK, uh, at contact period, um, the people in this zone had no boats, OK? Uh, and we have no evidence for it. And, and here's the, the interesting thing. It's funny, I, just, I was invited to a comparative coastal symposium that was in San Diego last week. And uh, I talked about this. Um, California Indians developed really complex, what, what I call maritime adaptations. And what I mean by maritime is they hunted whales. They hunted seals. How? They built planked shipworthy vessels and went out to sea like Northwest Coast Indians and Inuit do. Uh, the Chumash 
would go out and, and kill whales from boats. How did they do that? They have trees appropriate for building planks, right? The forests of California are, are great in the production of that kind of timber. South Africa doesn't have a tree like that. It has very low tree species diversity, and it's all scrubby Mediterranean maquia types of trees. There's no local timber uh, that could be made into ships. So when the Dutch got there in the 1650s, the Bushmen didn't have boats. But I think it's because they simply didn't have the right raw material to make it. So it's a long answer to your question. All right, who asked that? <laughs> So if, um, if these people in the Cape became really adapted to um, the ocean when it became time for their environment to expand, I guess, um, when, the, when the environment changed because of climate change, do we, see the, um, do we see the migration of these people going to the coasts first or through the center? And do you have an explanation as to of those people since then war could have been a conflict if the um, if we're talking about people that are gathering versus the people that are hunting wouldn't it make sense that the gatherers would be pushed out because the hunters that would have taken over their right. area and right. just where do we see the migration right yeah that's a great question and uh, some that and, and it's again it's it's due to ecological potentiality right and I, I was talking about the importance of um, the lack of trees in South Africa and the presence of trees in, here in California. If, if you drove from Cape Town along the coast all the way to Mombasa in Kenya, what you would see is you'd see Stone Age shellmans all the way up to northern South Africa, and then they start to disappear. And by the time you get to Kenya, there's nothing. Why? It's because intertidal resource richness um, is kind of the opposite of terrestrial resource richness. So terrestrial productivity goes up with temperature and rainfall. But the richest intertidal zones are in cold water, right? As you go to, into the tropics, that, those intertidal zones get uh, dystrophic or low nutrient. They're rich deep where the fish are and stuff, but they're very poor in the intertidal zone. So there's nothing there. So the areas in Africa where we have a rich Stone Age shell fishing are South Africa, where you have that cold upwelling current smashing together with uh, the warm um, Agullis current. And then the Atlantic coast of Morocco, which also has a, a cold upwelling current. Those are the richest, that's, and that's where we find Stone Age shellmans. So what I'm saying to you is, is that while I think the coastal adaptation um, was an incubator for complexity and the evolution of certain types of behaviors, once they left that zone, they lost that coastal resource use. And then they just adapted it to the, uh, their, the skill sets that they had to whatever was there. So. Um, they didn't stop being cooperating. Once cooperation evolved, that became such a successful adaptive system that they would just then use it wherever they went. So now instead of uh, you know, collecting shellfish, they cooperated to kill elephants in East Africa. You see what I'm saying? It was a break, breakthrough adaptation. We have one right here. Thank you for a very interesting talk. As a high school science teacher of physioanatomy and evolution, I've always accepted the out of Africa theory. Some people have denied it. And part of that, and perhaps you can tell me was wrong or right or not, was the expansion of the human brain with the omega-3s and the shellfish consumption, which would seem to verify also your presumption of the South Africa expansion northward. The second question is this, that, I mean, throughout human history, we've seen the competitions, the warfare, the fighting over resources. What I see today now is the contradiction that 
there are enough resources with technology to provide for everybody on the planet. And the contradiction is that there is not that sharing, that um, we become individualistic, maybe that ethnocentricity that you talked about, but it's the contradiction between social production of everything and capabilities and just not doing it. Right, yeah. Um, okay, so the first question and the I mean, point that you raised was the significance of omega-3 fatty acids. So omega-3 fatty acids are crucial for cog uh, healthy cognitive development and visual acuity, right? So if humans don't have sufficient omega-3s, you suffer cognitive deficiency and, and a visual acuity will go down. Um, we can't produce them physiologically, so they must be taken in in your diet. Uh, the biggest, best source for omega-3 fatty acids is the marine food chain. You know, no argument. Um, so, and shellfish get the omega-3 fatty acids from grazing the algae. So the ultimate source is the algae, right? I know you were talking about important these. This is where we can do a lot of good with the ocean in the future for trying to feed people in a healthy manner. If we can figure out how, how to do it right. Um, so, but what happens when you remove it? Um, there, are other, there are other sources in the environment for omega-3 fatty acids. So brains of antelope, for example. Uh, my, it hasn't really been studied well. You know, My guess would be modern humans would figure it out. We would, they would figure out the foods they needed to eat. So let's suppose you have a coastal adaptation. They, people have evolved in the context of rich omega-3 fatty acids being generally available. Now they leave that coastal environment and they head into the interior of Africa. They must be adapting a diet to maintain that, that, that dietary requirement. So that must include things like processing brains of antelope, liver, and so on, where they're going to pick up those, those essential nutrients. If not, they're going to have trouble. Um, so we know that hunter-gatherer populations live all over the world. A lot of them don't have coastal resource use, but they're not cognitively deficient or deficient in visual acuity. So they've adapted to it. Um, did that answer the question, the, the first? OK. So what about, so the second question. Um, you know, unfortunately, I think that parochial altruism, outgroup bias, is inherent in people. And when people are challenged with scarcity, they go back on instinct, which is where I think there was all this uh, super nationalistic stuff that's going on in various areas of the world. Uh, during the recession, you saw a lot of it. So I think that is, uh, that is a kind of a, it's, it's an instinctual behavior that's triggered by loss of resources. So how do we conquer it? Well, you know, uh, I think that having a system that's better at sharing resources is the way that you get around the triggers that set people off. Um, and I guess that's a little bit of a mix of politics and science, but I think it's borne out by what we know about it from an evolutionary perspective on human behavior. I think people will fight and kill when they need to, need to get things they don't have. And I, as you mentioned, water is, is the big looming yes. issue. If you look at what's happening on the Mekong River, and China's building enough dams in the upper reaches of that to take all the water out of that river before it ever gets down to the delta. Right. And it's very scary. All right, we have one more in the back, and I think then we'll call it an evening. Oh, you got your answer? I think this was a terrific talk, okay. and we thank, thank you. you very much for coming. Okay, thanks. And, and next week, we hope you'll come back. We're going to have a talk on uh, urbanism. It's a woman from MIT. She's analyzed a lot of satellite data about what's happening to cities all over the world, and I think you would enjoy it.